So thank you all again for coming. Um, my name is Sarah Brown. I'm a strategic partnerships manager for Facebook. I'm based in London, working mainly with UK partners, also in Ireland. And I focus on partnership management, but also working with journalists. Um, before I came to Facebook in 2014, I was a journalist myself for 15 years. Started off in print before moving to the BBC, where I worked on the World Desk for a few years. Um, before joining Al Jazeera in 2006, and then later on in my career joining CNN in 2012. So much like yourselves in the room, um, I still have that temptation whenever there's a big breaking news story to spring into action, and I have to remember that I'm no longer a journalist. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you um, about just some of the many things that we offer as a platform for journalists. Um, if I included absolutely everything we did, this would be about three hours long, and you have plenty of other panels and workshops to go to. But that being said, I just want to give you a sense of some of the things that we do. So I'll be starting off with a little bit of news gathering. Then we're going to talk about Facebook as a, a presence for journalists, as a platform for journalists. How can you leverage your presence on the platform um, to maximize the benefit for yourselves and also the publications, the partners you work for? Um, and then I'll show a bit of best practice around posting I'll be looking at Facebook Live. And then finally, just to wrap up, I'll be giving you some ideas about where you can go for more information for journalists um, and how you can help find out more information as well. Um, also, just to reiterate that after this presentation, I will be in the Facebook space. Um, so if you have any more questions, um, absolutely feel free to come grab me. Um, and at the end of each section, I'll be stopping for questions as well. So feel free to go for it. So this slide is pretty self-explanatory, but I just wanted to get a sense or give a sense to yourselves of the different buckets of ways that we help work with journalists. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the process of discovery, um, which you know, with news gathering is the very obvious things. It's Facebook and Instagram search, which I'm sure at some point you have all used. Um, and this is something we've really worked on to make sure that it, as an experience, helps kind of curate and discover information for you. So if you have a news story developing or a news story you're covering, when you search now, it comes up with not just perhaps the primary source of the story. The example I give is if Ronaldo ever, you know, God forbid, left Real Madrid, um, his main post might come up when you search, but so would the primary sources or news organizations reporting it. So would perhaps the fan groups of Real Madrid who are discussing it, um, and so would some of the people who are posting about it publicly too. So it's a major part of discovering content on our platform. There's the Facebook Live Map. Has anyone explored this at all? One, two people put their hands up. Let's make it four, no, th three. Let's make it six by the end of this session. Uh, and finally, Facebook groups. Um, we have more than one billion Facebook groups. Um, and we'll be talking about them a little bit later in terms of news, gather news gathering and exploring new audiences. Then, of course, we have distribution, a major part of our platform for journalists. And here we have a plethora of different things that you can use. For example, we have obviously Facebook Live, we have video, we have instant articles and notes, we have 360 video, we now will soon be having a 360 live video, which I'm sure some of you may have already seen, and not to mention Messenger and of course in the near term future virtual reality. And then finally on the right hand side we have engagement, and this is of course the really fantastic area where our platform really helps you guys to organize and to thrive. So there's obviously the kind of Q&A element and polls, but it's just a general interaction that you have with your audience. So getting started on Facebook as a journalist, I always like to point to this post by Dan Rather, veteran CBS News correspondent now, I believe in his 80s, who posted this um, last year about the fact that he's found almost a new uh, kind of official or, or kind of um, lease of life on the platform. And he wrote this piece about why he'd found Facebook useful as a way to engage with an audience and a demographic that probably he hadn't really touched with before and how he liked the fact that it was a two-way street. When I do trainings with journalists, I always talk about how Facebook is a two-way street, and you give and you get in recipro reciprocity in return. This is so important. And Dan referred to that kind of interaction as a virtual town hall. And I think that's a really beautiful way to describe the potential conversations that you as journalists can be creating around stories that matter, around communities that matter, for example, if you're working in local news, um, and how to kind of leverage what you have on that platform to make it really worthwhile. So, news gathering. So, I wanted to talk about groups. First of all, who here is in a Facebook group? And would you, any of you be able to tell me what sort of group it is? Would you like to tell me what kind of group you're a member of at Facebook? 
an internal company group, okay? We're, we're all members of lots of groups on Facebook. Some people are fans of groups about cats. Some people are fans of, I'm a fan, for example, of local organization in my area that works with children. But they're a really fantastic area to news gather for content uh, in two ways. So first of all, there's creating groups. The example we give here on the, on the right, top right side is the New York Times. And they wanted to do a series of really thoughtful pieces on the state of healthcare in America. Continually a very important story in that country. But they wanted to get personal stories. So they leveraged our platform by creating a group. It was public, so anyone could find it. Um, and they created, obviously, you can control who joins. They controlled that as well. And they asked people for their personal experiences. And a lot of people posted how they had found the healthcare experience, how it had varied state to state. And they ended up getting some really, really quite poignant and meaningful stories from this as a result. So this is a really great way, particularly with first-person content that we all know can really resonate on our platform and to really create some great stories. The bottom right-hand side is actually uh, from the UK. And this was an area in the UK that about two, three years ago had terrible flooding. I mean, whole communities were, were very badly damaged. And they, in the area, had created their own support network in order to help people in need. But they also invited journalists in, asked them to... Um, you know, help people in need, write the stories, get the word out that they were a community in trouble and they needed help. So again, you can create groups to create content, but you can also search for ones to find really great content. I also wanted to flag um, some courses that we put together with First Draft um, that were available on our website that we launched uh, late last year, facebook.com forward slash journalists. This has been a really big part of how we want to do training at scale. Um, I do training in newsrooms, but I am one person. We haven't figured out cloning yet, so how do I make sure that we have something that's great that we can put into as many different newsrooms as possible across the world? And particularly when it comes to things like news gathering, we want to be able to share some of the knowledge we have, but also first drafts. So these are four pieces that we get together, and if you go to the facebook.com forward slash journalist site, we have them there. And one of them is on using the live map, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but also using search, also doing things like searching Instagram by location. For example, when I was at CNN, the terrible earthquake in Nepal hit, and I reckon probably around 80% of the user-generated content that I found was on Instagram through looking at the locations, um, but also kind of checking in kind where people were posting and generating content from there. And this is just a quick example of one of the videos, by the way. I won't play the whole thing, but it just gives you an idea of some of the ways that we put together ways to news gather content. Great. And this is the Facebook Live map. Who has looked at this on the left-hand side of their page or profile? Two, three, four, six, five. Same people that were six. Okay, well, there we are. Slowly more and more hands are going up then. Um, so the live map's a great way to discover all public lives. Um, and so it, this is not a picture in real time, by the way. I'm not that good at screen grabbing. Um, but this shows you all the public lives around the world any given moment when you're looking. And this is useful, again, for news gathering in a few ways. So one, when you take a look at it, you can get a sense of stories that are bubbling up. The example I often give is that um, a few months ago, Last year, a certain city in the north of England, where I'm from, um, was absolutely huge on this map. It involved football. Would anyone be able to tell you what, me what that city could have been? Leicester, Leicester City. I can tell I'm in a football-loving country. Yes, it was. Uh, some of my American colleagues are like, where's Leicester and what's going on there? Um, but it's a classic example of a lot of people were there, you know, ordinary, everyday people, who had gone to celebrations in the city center, had gone live and produced this really extraordinary content of what it was like to be in a city that against all the odds had won the title. So a lot of people, uh, journalists I work with, had used that night, had gone into the live map, searched for these people, had got in contact with them, and as a result had used the content that they'd sourced from that. So that's a really good way to look. It's also um, useful to just see, again, like I said, seeing where stories go. So for example, the eastern seaboard of the US was very heavily um, lit up with lives a few months ago because of the storm that hit there. So again, a really good way to generate content. It's also a really good way to have your lives accessed by other people too. So if you're going live, if you're a journalist in the field, if you're going live from, say, if you're covering the US election last year and you went live from Kansas when you were talking to voters, 
it would appear on this map. And people can then discover it and watch it in kind. So you're upping your viewership. One thing to note is make sure that you tag clearly where you are and make sure you have in your settings where you are. Otherwise, it'll just default to where your page is traditionally set. So we've had partners who've gone live in perhaps somewhere like Germany, but for some reason, well, because the location's wrong on the settings, they've sort of turned up in London, in the UK. So if you want people to find it correctly, make sure the settings are correct there. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my CrowdTangle colleagues. So we um, acquired CrowdTangle a few months ago, um, and they are an analytics and discovery tool. I don't want to give the game away too much because my colleague Asha from CrowdTangle is giving a presentation tomorrow at 10 a.m., and she'll kill me. Um, but also, it's worth checking out in terms of the many different things and many things they offer as a platform, or as a tool, I should say. So obviously one of the platforms is analysis, so looking at your content that you're creating and seeing how it's working and testing it in kind. But it's also great for building lists of sources. So example, last year, the terrible attack in Orlando, Florida, and, and a gay nightclub. Um, journalists were building lists of primary sources there. So they were trying to find the local police, the local fire, the hospital, um, blood drives, community groups, building lists so that they could keep an eye on the sources and when new things came up with new knowledge and information, they could grab it and add it to the story. We all know particularly sometimes that those first few hours of breaking news are crucial. Not just because you want to be first, but because you want to be right. And if you have lists of primary sources that you can draw from as quickly as possible, this is a really good way to source it. So that concludes part of the news gathering section. Did anyone have any questions before I moved on to reaching the audience? No? Okay, great, we'll move on to the next part. So when you're thinking about establishing your presence on Facebook, the number one question I get asked by journalists is, well, what sort of you know, presence should I have? Should it be a profile or should it be a page? Um, and the answer is, it's entirely up to you. If you want to keep your professional and your personal completely separate on Facebook, absolutely fine. In which case, I would advise you create a separate page and then you manage them differently by toggling between the two on what we call the blue app. Some people prefer having just a profile, particularly maybe investigative journalists or people with sources because they want to be able to message. Conversely, some people like having a page because again, keeping it separate, but also you have access to analytics. So you can really get a sense of what sorts of content you're creating are resonating with your audience. And by the way, I appreciate that this is probably quite small type. So if you want afterwards, um, let us know and I can email you a soft copy. So once you've decided what your presence would be, how do you leverage the expertise that you have in your newsrooms? How do you get your journalists to really start creating that great content? So, um, I'm in the back so this is an example Carl of and, uh, Kay Burley from Sky News. So this was Kay literally in the back of a London cab. And what had happened was, uh, they just Scotland had just announced they were going to seek a second referendum. Um, we've had a busy year in UK politics, by the way, you may have noticed. Um, and she was sent off onto the story, and it was, you know, this had only been announced about half an hour ago in the wires, the flash had come through, she'd hopped in a cab with her producer, who you'll see shortly, and she's there immediately giving you the context and the, co and the background and the where's and the why's of the story. And this is great in many ways. First of all, we've talked a lot at this conference about reality. I mean, like Mark Little talked about restoring trust in journalists. I mean, one interesting bit was that at one point some guy said, are you really in the back of a London cab? And she actually, at some point, turned the phone around and then she said in the comments, yes, I am. So again, establishing that level of trust with the audience immediately. And also, it's her expertise. She's been an anchor in the UK for many years. She's covered many stories. And she's showing you that process of how news is creating. She's demystifying it. She's showing you how it works. She's explaining the process. And she's moving the story forward in order to show you how that kind of curtain is rolled away and news content creation is developed. And I can't stress this enough is that you are all the experts here. You are the people in the newsrooms with the knowledge, with the expertise, that when you go out in the field, when you do Q&As with the audience, you can bring that expertise and leverage that for your audiences and also for the publishers that you work for. Showcasing content. So you started thinking about creating some great content for your Facebook page or profile. 
what sort of things do you want to do? And by the way, I apologize for the terrible pun in the headline there. It was very late when I was writing this. So this uh, example that I give here is um, Liam Dutton. He's a weather correspondent for Channel 4 News in the UK. And this is just a very quick piece of video that he took um, on a sunny day in London, which is, as we all know, incredibly rare. And he just wanted to give a sense very quickly, as he was possibly traveling around, what the weather was like that day. And this did incredibly well, ultimately. But it's all about kind of showing how those little stolen moments as you're going about your day as a journalist can really provide interesting context to a story and provide extra content. One thing that people also often ask me is, when I'm doing a post on my page, should I keep the text really short and punchy? The answer is it's completely up to you. For, for breaking news situations, yes, probably is. But that being said, if you're a journalist and you're probably working on something more featurey or looking at the kind of context or analysis, that's a really good chance to help your content shine. And particularly if you want people to click through to read the whole thing, draw them in. Was there an interesting piece in that interview you did or the piece you wrote that really stuck out for you? If it was an interview, did they say something interesting? What were their attitudes like? Was there a great quote that really drove you in and made you think that was fascinating? Put a little bit of that in the post of your story. Tempt them to kind of come in and learn more about your understanding of how the process of new work, news works, but also a kind of interesting tidbit to draw them in. Secondly, again, this is the two-way street, asking people for their thoughts and their responses from the users. The interaction that you get from your audience is so key here. It not only enriches the story and the experience, but it also potentially gives you new leads. It helps you hone the conversation, um, and it provides the audience with a knowledge that you're not just a machine, the faceless machine in the background. You're a person who can cover the news, who is an expert in their field, and can provide them with the news that they need. Posting in a timely manner. Obviously, breaking news is breaking news. You want to add the door, right? But that being said, we often find, or I often find with partners, it's the next day when the story's had time to like, kind of marinate, if you will, and when people are waking up and going, well, what happens now? What could this possibly mean? And this is really where the thoughts, the analysis, the context, the expertise of a journalism comes into play, where you can kind of explain using what you know as much as you can to tell a story. So again, a really good way to keep a story going. Very practical point, tagging people and places. If you tag a person with quite a large page, you are potentially serving, well, it's the content that you, the person you tag, it makes it eligible to appear in the feed of anyone who's also liked that page. So if you do a story about NASA and tag NASA, potentially that content could appear in the feed of people who've also liked the NASA page. So in one fell swoop, you've expanded the reach of the potentially of that post. Now, I wouldn't advise tagging NASA all the time if it's completely irrelevant just because they have a really massive page. But that being said, if you're writing about a celebrity or a known person or a politician or a place, if they have a good Facebook page, tag it in. And if you're doing a reciprocal interview, you could always ask the person you're interviewing or the place that you're talking about to also share the post or do their own post too. the right content and the right product. You probably remember at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the many different ways that you can create and distribute content on a platform. And a lot of this is about what's the right way to display content. This is a post from Will Goodbody. He's a science correspondent for RTE in Ireland. And he did this fantastic trip to Chile. And he went to the European Southern Observatory where they have these extraordinarily massive um, dishes where they just pointed at the sky. And he took, and unfortunately I can't get it to properly work on this computer, but they took a beautiful 360 image of what it was like to be in the desert with this extraordinary, there's no natural, there's no artificial light, so you can see thousands of millions of stars, um, and it felt immersive. It was like you were actually standing there watching. Now, do you think that would have worked as a text post? No, it wouldn't have had the same impact. So thinking about what would work for what way is really important. Now. If you are a local journalist covering a council meeting, maybe a 360 photo for that wouldn't be the best thing in the world, but a text post or a link post could work equally as well. So thinking about the right type of post for the right thing would be super useful. Moving on to storytelling. I wanted to talk about the different ways that journalists post that really resonate with the audience. And we kind of talked about them and thought about them in terms of four buckets. So first of all, there's timely. I mean, yes, obviously there's breaking news. Obviously being as quick as possible and being smart about getting people, content into people's feed is great. 
but also being mindful of things like anniversaries. So on the left-hand side here, I'm, I'm trying not to fall off the stage here, sorry. Um, this is Remy Bouzine, he's a French journalist, and he wrote a very meaningful post about the Bataclan attacks, the Paris attacks. One year on, he walked past the club where the worst of the attacks had happened, and he talks about what it was like to, to be there, but also what it was like to walk past in a year's time with the door still boarded up. So it was a very emotional post in many ways. It was still very professional, but it made you think. And it was very, very shareable and did very well. So again, it was very timely. It was when people were thinking about that story all over again, and it tapped into a nerve. This is relevant. Um, this is a very long text piece, which I know superficially doesn't look very interesting, but this is the royal correspondent of ITV News, Chris Ship, and we obviously had a very sad terror attack a few weeks ago in London, and he wrote about this, the uh, policeman who died. And he wrote a very lovely piece about how he had covered Westminster for many years, and he never really thought about walking past these guys every day, what potentially they might face. And this was shared thousands and thousands of times. I think it was because it was personal, because it was a, a very much in the first person, but also it was based on his experiences and his expertise. It's a very beautiful piece of content and very relevant again to that story. This conversational, again, I can't talk about it enough, the two-way street. So this is Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times. He interviewed the Sweden's foreign minister, Margaret Wallström. He also tagged her page. Well done, Nicholas. Good practice there. And he just did this really lovely interview with her, um, which is very conversational, very chatty. And what Nick does so well is he goes into the comments. He thanks, he thanks people. If often people post him links to other stories, he thanks them, he chats with them, he politely might disagree with them. But either way, he keeps the conversation going. And that's always really great if you're storytelling. Remember, your story doesn't stop when you post it on a platform. In many ways, it's only the beginning. And finally, there's authenticity. Now, obviously, as a journalist, your Facebook page or profile is verified. People are gonna know it's you anyway. But also, there's just showing the unique access um, and uh, kind of authenticity of your voice. So, for example, on the right-hand side, this is Vaishali. She's a London football correspondent for the Evening Standard. And she just showed, like, a picture of herself with um, one of the... I think it was a well, well, Welsh footballer. She took a picture of that. So, again, it's showing authenticity, but also access. You guys in the room are getting access to places that we will never be able to cover. I will never go to Mosul. I will never go to Fallujah. I will never go to Syria. I will never go to any of these places. Maybe, maybe not. But a lot of you guys have. And you have a knowledge and authenticity of, that you bring to the table of that, which is fantastic for the audience. And this is just a quick thing, again, about what to post. So as you're building up your Facebook presence, posting consistently, posting authoritatively, but also posting authentically, but also posting in different ways. So obviously we've already talked about the, different, the right content for the right, the right type of post for the right content. But there's also just about sometimes the right fit for the right story as well. So, just a few more examples here. This is Sam Luckhurst from Manchester Evening News. He's a great young journalist for that paper, covers football. Obviously, in Manchester, it keeps him rather busy. And he here did, obviously, he can't show the football game because it's rights, but he can show the new Manchester United football chant, at least the not-so-rude ones. Um, so, this is a really great example of a nice piece of content that he most opportunistically created. We've already talked about Kay Burley, um, Jon Snow, veteran Channel 4 correspondent who went live from the US election. Live is a really good resource, particularly if you're from um, a background which is maybe not traditionally broadcast, but also you may not have the resources to create video. So live is a really great way for something that fits in your pocket that you can really take advantage of um, and create some great content. And we're going to talk about live again in a minute. Um, and finally, again, on the right-hand side, it's the access. This is Nazanin, who's a weather presenter. Weather does very well on Facebook, by the way. I mean, I'm not just saying that because I'm British. It really does very, very well. Um, but again, she's showing the fantastic access she has to kind of different celebrities as well. Did anybody have any questions on that session? We're all very hot, clearly. <laughs> Facebook Live and video. Okay, who here has done a Facebook Live? People from Facebook aren't allowed to put their hands up. Okay, couple, professionally or personally or both? Both? Professionally? Okay, make sure the two. Yeah? Great. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I have a question about Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it's a really, really great instrument. But what do you think about um, when grabbing on Facebook Live could affect um, some events that are covered by television? I mean, for example, if I am at the stadium like these, um, I'm grabbing, uh, it, it was grabbing the, the fans, mm -hmm. okay? But if the grab goes to the field, you know that there are some television rights, mm -hmm. the, some television channels that pay yeah. to, to buy this. So it ride. wasn't during the game. It was okay. before the game. Yeah. Okay. He's in, very, in this yeah. case, but I, I can go to the stadium like a pr private citizen and do a Facebook Live on the field. You would get pulled down very quickly. <laughs> yes. We have, um, you can, re lives can be reported for copyright uh -huh. violation. We're very strict on IP. Uh, either automated, lives we can pull down very quickly, or if someone reports it, we pull it down as well. But, but I mean... Same with music. If people play music that's not okay. theirs, it's the same thing. So basically, Facebook locks the, uh, and put, puts down... Well, it's down a combination of two. It's one, if we sense that there's copyrighted music or rights being violated, yes. And two, if someone reports it. So mm -hmm. if someone spots that someone is maybe trying to video... Uh, a TV screen showing a football game, for example. If someone reported it, we would assess it and then take it down accordingly if we felt the need to. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Facebook Live. So what do people like about Facebook Live? This is based on research. Oh, sorry, another question. Sorry. sorry. I just want to ask a question about Facebook Live. Uh, during the Westminster um, attacks in London, I believe, I hope I'm right about this, but I believe there was a Facebook Live stream showing news about the attacks and uh, it was screenshotted at a point where it was believed that a lot of people were were emoting to show that they were enjoying the stream or that they were happy with what mm -hmm. was going on and that was used as a, a, a sort of weapon of propaganda by mm -hmm. people who said look you know these people hate us etc is there a way of controlling or switching off that so mm -hmm. if you're doing a facebook live about a serious subject you don't get lots of people going i love this i'm so glad these people are suffering yeah that's a good question and and not yet if you're watching privately uh you can swipe to hide um in that respect but not right now with the reactions um it is a piece of feedback we've had from from some people and it's something that we've we're looking at at the moment okay oh there's one question over here with the lady here Eh, se lo fa un ente pubblico, e, cioè, appunto, riprende anche, oltre che la conferenza stampa, anche il pubblico, abbiamo problemi di privacy? I wish I spoke better Italian. Um, oh, bear with me one second. Sorry. No, not at all. Am I supposed to be hearing something? Sì, se, se lo fa un ente pubblico e riprende una conferenza e lo stesso riprende anche il pubblico, ci sono problemi di privacy? Oh, uh, privacy issues around filming. Sorry, privacy issues around filming. Um, I would use the same journalistic practices here that you would do as a professional broadcaster. So obviously you would not walk into a school and start filming. If you're in a public place, then obviously it's, it's fine. If it's somewhere that rights could be affected, as in copyright rights, don't film there. If you don't have permission, don't do it. The same, the same things you would have in place as a journalist, you would do for life. Um, the same as not deliberately filming children, filming above their heads, as you know when they do crowd shots, they or they film people from behind if they're doing a generic story. Use the same journalistic practices that you would for live as you would with television live or with, with any other communication or broadcast. Thank you. I'm sorry my Italian isn't better. <laughs> I now have about eight words now. I'm doing quite well since going to Perugia. So um, we did a little bit of research about Facebook Live and why people seem to like it, both people as in journalists who use it and consumers. Uh, and we kind of bracketed them to five main areas. Um, if you take one thing away from today, though, I know I bang on about this a lot. It's the social connection. It's the two-way street. To me, a Facebook Live isn't a Facebook Live unless you're interacting with the audience. That is what it's about. It's live and it's immersive and it's real time. And you are building a connection with the audience. So whenever you're doing a live, think about how you are building that in kind. There's also the immediacy and the immersiveness of it. Um, obviously now we have Live 360, which will be extraordinary if you're in particularly incredible areas. If Will had had that when he'd gone to Chile, to the Southern Observatory, it would have been extraordinary. But also just about when you're in the middle of a story, um, of a breaking news story, 
uh, with all the caveats that any breaking news story would entail. You're pulling people into the heart of it. And I think anything that involves demystifying the news process, particularly nowadays, is so important. There's also the unique perspective. Again, you are journalists who are experts in your field and you have a unique take, whether you're an opinion writer or a beat journalist or a broadcaster or an anchor or a local news journalist. Again, you have a perspective that no one else has. Use it. We talked about authenticity already, but also excitement and surprise, showing things that are interesting, that are offbeat, that are quirky, but you know, even telling you know, serious news but trying to do it in a more interesting and offbeat way, always incredibly exciting for the audience. And I just wanted to go through a couple of examples here. So um, these are a few journalists that uh, I believe have been doing a really good job live. So for example, we have on the left-hand side, this is Robert Peston from ITV News. This was actually his first live. He was at Davos um, on a hill, literally well, on a mountain, I should say. And he just, uh, just literally just went live and just started talking to the audience about why he was there, what was so interesting about it. And he got hundreds of comments within about five, 10 minutes. He is one of the UK's better known journalists. But again, the fact that he was willing to be so accessible and willing to talk about the news, and again, he's considered a voice of authority, really lent itself to a really interesting and engaging live. He also, again, interacted with the audience. He thanked them. He said he might ask one of the questions one woman asked. He said he might ask the prime minister. Um, so he brought a lot of really, really good stuff to the table there. And second from right is a guy called Justin Allen. Justin Allen's a football reporter. Um, I have a lot of football examples in here, even though I'm not really a football fan. But anyway, beat reporting does very well on Facebook. And uh, Justin, again, he's a football correspondent. He gets great access. Um, but he's also, again, incredibly engaging. Um, he gets access to a lot of the managers. He sits down, does really interesting conversations with them. He's not afraid to give his opinion on very important stories. He creates the community. And football, football fans, as we know, very passionate people, and he really, really works with that to create a really interesting page and really interesting content. Some of you may know this gentleman. So Mr. Poro has built a wonderful page based on the fantastic daily content that he does. Um, whenever I watch it, I'm very jealous that Italy is always beautiful and sunny compared to where I am in very rainy England. But he's a classic case of somebody who's really worked with his page to create really great content. Um, he does post every day, which helps, although you know, regular posting of content always is fantastic. He's very engaging and timely. He talks about the news of the day. And it's very diverse content. He'll sometimes go into the field. He'll use guest stars. He likes to kind of mix it up a little bit, which I like. And he talked about how he liked the fact it was immediate and transparent. I think also thinking about how you can incorporate using Facebook into your everyday work processes. When I work with journalists, they often say to me, well, this is great, Sarah, but I don't have time. So in that case, it's thinking about what are you already doing as part of your day? Are you already having a morning meeting that you can have, maybe have as a Facebook Live and discuss? Are you going out to conduct an interview? Is that something that could be really interesting for the audience? Are you going out to field report? Even if you're just like Liam Dutton, who filmed Sunshine on a very rare sunny day in London, again, it's thinking about putting those processes into place as part of your work day. Really useful way to not feel that you're adding to your time, but you're actually incorporating it into your workflow. Buongiorno, benvenuti alla rassegna stampa di oggi, domenica 12 marzo, quindi buona domenica a tutti quanti voi. Allora, la notizia oggi sui giornali per tutti. And just finally, I just wanted to go through um, one or two quick things that are... You know, oh, by the way, was there any questions more on Facebook Live? Sorry, before I finish off that part. The lady here on the right-hand side. It's pretty toasty in here now. Hi. Um, well, uh, we were experiencing some performance or let's say connectivity problems uh, while streaming live on Facebook. Is that um, a common problem or what do you recommend how to put on the stream? Connectivity? Oh, yeah. yeah. So we are slightly hamstrung by hardware and just connectivity where you are. That being said, um, a couple of things. I mean, one, if you're doing a Facebook Live that maybe in advance so you know where you're going to be, you can always check it out the day before, check the connection is good. Another thing you can do is you can go live, but set the live or the post when you go live to only me and do a test that only shows on your page. Then you can check the connectivity, check the picture, make sure it works okay. So when you actually go live from your professional Facebook page or whichever 
you have it or you know it's going to be well done and well to go. Sometimes people use MiFi's, my colleague Julia flagged those to me, um, portable Wi-Fi connection. That can be good, particularly if you're in the field um, and you never know like, what the connectivity is going to be day to day. Um, and just on a practical level, if you're out and about, if you're covering something, you know you're going to be moving around a lot. If, you, if you're doing the live and you're the person talking or holding the camera while you're doing it and you go into an area of no connectivity, be honest with the audience. Say to them, sorry guys, I've entered a, an area of low connectivity. I'm losing the picture. I'm just going to go back to where I was before. And if you're doing that, it A, shows the user that you know, and B, just practically speaking, gets the, the line better. And uh, in my experience, people are not shy to tell you on a Facebook Live if, if they can't see or hear you. So those would be my top tips there. Great, so two final tips of useful things to use. Who here has used notes? One, two at the back, a couple here, okay. This is just a really great way for content that maybe you're not gonna click through to, but it's something that perhaps if you're a columnist or if you wanted to write a few thoughts and reflections on a story you're covering. Um, I've often, this is an example from Ian Bremer, a journalist um, who talked about the Syria crisis. And it's just a way of, if you don't want it to be a simple Facebook text post, you can actually put a head photo on it, you can do subheadings and just make it look a bit aesthetically pleasing. It's on the left-hand side navigation of your Facebook page. I find a lot of lifestyle publications, for example, use this for like cooking recipes or beauty hacks and things like that. It often seems to work really nicely. And finally, author tags. Has anybody heard of author tags in this room? One sort of maybe, not really sure. Um, so this is something that if you have journalists that you want to basically create an ecosystem where people can find more of their content. Um, this is a simple piece of code to put in the page, and it means that you can drive people to their pages and therefore to discoverability of more content. Um, this is an example of Ezra Klein, editor of Vox. Ezra is responsible for a very, very large portion of Vox traffic. Um, so when they post content by him, they obviously want to post, follow, um, excuse me, port people towards his page where they can potentially discover more of his content, click through, read more, um, and discoverability becomes even better that way. So this is on, if you just Google Facebook author tags, it should show you the page with the coding that you need to do to use it. And so just to sum up some of the things that we've been talking about today. So if you're thinking about your presence on Facebook and how you can leverage it, number one, leverage you and your newsroom's expertise. As I said before, you are the experts in the field. You know how you're doing it, what you're doing, and what works best for you. So think about the, the knowledge and the expertise you have and use it accordingly. Number two is very practical, page versus profile. Think about what works for you. If you want to have everything in one place, have the profile and toggle between the two. If you want a professional presence, set up a separate Facebook page. The control is absolutely yours, entirely up to you what you want to do. News gathering, I always say think like an eyewitness. So think about the different tools you have at um, your exposure, at your um, disposal, excuse me, on Facebook and Instagram. Think about the kind of hashtags people would use. What would they be saying? Where would they be posting? How would they be expressing it? Um, think about the sort of things they might say if they were posting from a breaking news story and where they might be posting it from. Starting conversations, yes, I'm gonna say it again, but it is a two-way street. Really think about how you can reach out to your audience and bring them back in kind. Show them that you very much want them to be a part of the content you create. And finally, the practical stuff too, incorporating your existing work into your Facebook content. So whatever you're doing as part of your day as a journalist, how can you use that to really create some fantastic content um, for more people to find on the platform? And just finally, because as I said, I am but one person, um, but we would love for you to find out more about what we do. Um, two very important things, to actually three. Um, first of all is our website, facebook.com forward slash journalists. This is where we have a lot of courses, um, learning more about 360, uh, live video, how to news gather, the first draft courses are also on this as well. Definitely worth checking out. On the right hand side is our news media and publishing group. Is anybody here a member of this? Okay, quite a few, great. We're really close to 10,000, so just FYI, if you fancy it. Um, this is great for several reasons. One, we post here every day during the week, product updates, um, case studies, best practice, if, if we spotted a bug that we think you should know about, um, different pieces, so you'll hear from us every day, and we also interact with yourselves, so you can also interact with your peers. 
So we'll have someone from the Hindustan Times comparing live experiences with somebody from Eastern Europe. So it's a great place to interact and find out more information. And just finally, I don't have the, the, the link here, but if you go to facebook.com forward slash newsletter, we have an EMEA-focused newsletter that we send out once a week with, again, information about product updates, best practice. We also do, like, lives that we've seen around the world that have been very cool, can spark some really interesting ideas about what people are doing on the platform. And finally, if you have, we'll have a few bit of time for questions now, but if you want to find out more, I'm going to be in the Facebook space just across the hallway. I'd love to chat, so do feel free to come and grab me. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Did anybody else have any final questions? Lady at the front. So I use all the tools that are fantastic to create fantastic um, content. And if I like spend a few hours a day or a week mm -hmm. and publish it on your platform and serve your audience to like get the conversation going. Who your pays audience, yep. for the time spent on that? Because it's your audience I serve. Well, it's journals. your audience because you're posting to yes, people who are finding your, your content. It's your audience and your plot platform is being like... Well, it's our platform, but the content you're posting is yours. So at the moment, there are several ways to monetize and several ways that we're working on. One at the moment, obviously, instant articles. The second one is monetization around Facebook Live and also Facebook video, oh, sorry, excuse me, is on live, but also video on demand. So these at the moment are very small tests in the US, but we're hoping to roll them out all over the world, obviously, including Europe. And we appreciate it takes a while, but we want to get it right. So at the moment, we're testing to get feedback. And then as it works and we feel that people are in a good place, both the user, so the experience is good for them, and the publisher, it's working for you as well, then we will roll it out more. So. We, you know, we are mindful that you know, monetization is incredibly important on the platform, and so we're doing a lot of work at the moment around making sure that works for you. Wonderful. Oh, no, one at the back. Maybe I have to update my app, but why can't we do things on mobile that we can do on desktop? I mean, things like tagging, uh, Facebook pages instead of accounts, for example, from an account. I can oh, on, do it on the from mobile app. Yeah. It's if it, if you try doing at. Yeah. So if you yeah. It doesn't work though. Somet sometimes not it works always, and yeah. sometimes it doesn't. It is a little bit funny sometimes. It's yeah. not ideal. It's something we keep looking at, but um, we keep trying to make sure that what works for the mobile works for desktop too. Uh, we'd like to roll out desktop live more, for example. Um, but yeah, with that, that can just is a case of sometimes being a little bit buggy and can't find the page. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, and hope to see you in the Facebook space afterwards. Thank you for your time.